Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Talmadge with Love of Christ Lutheran Church in Mesa, Arizona. Each week, Pastor Nanette Christofferson and I try to offer a brief introduction to two of the upcoming lessons assigned to the Sunday. I want to look at the gospel reading for this coming Sunday, September 27, 2020. It is Matthew 21, verses 23 to 32. I always invite you to have your Bibles and to read the verses that are a part of the gospel and sometimes reading more to just get context. The setting of this gospel reading is the temple in Jerusalem, and it is what we call the time period we call Holy Week. The three-year public ministry of Jesus, his preaching, teaching, and healing is now coming to a conclusion. Matthew sought to record and tell his community the stories he believed the Spirit led him to include in this gospel account. Much has been said about what the kingdom of heaven or the reign and rule of God is like. Up to this point and just a little bit later, Matthew 25, we'll listen to Jesus teach about the great reversals that happen when God's reign and rule are at work within God's beloved community. The least, the last, the lost, and the little are lifted up as a priority and also as an example of kingdom living. Throughout the gospel, there has been contrast between the first will be last and the last will be first, such as we heard in the parable of the vineyards last Sunday. There's the affirmation of children and childlike faith as essential to discover true greatness. In Matthew's gospel, we see servant leadership, cross-bearing, denying oneself for the sake of neighbor and community are all characteristics of kingdom of heaven residents. We get stories about tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners in general being affirmed and welcome guests at Jesus' dinner table and in heaven. It is often the most educated, religious, and respectable in the community and religious circles that are seen as the ones who are missing the whole point of what kingdom living is like. It seems the more respectable one is, the less there is a sense of the need for God's amazing unconditional love, which we call grace. The challenge to Jesus' authority in our gospel reading and the story he tells play into all of that, uh, of what Matthew's been trying to communicate up to this point. The context of this gospel reading. First, in Matthew 21, 1 to 11, we have the Palm Sunday procession in the city of Jerusalem. We had Jesus riding that donkey and the hosannas and the palm branches. Then immediately after that, we have in 12 to 17 of chapter 21, Jesus driving the money changers out of the temple, calling God's house to be a house of prayer. And then in Matthew 21, 18 to 22, we have Jesus returning to Jerusalem and he's hungry and he comes upon a barren fig tree. He curses the tree for not doing what it was made to do bear fruit. He ends this little scene in verse 22 with, whatever you ask for in prayer with faith, you will receive. Tied into that scene is Jesus cursing that tree, causing it to wither, and the disciples are like, wow, what's, what's going on here? But this really is a picture story of God calling the people of Israel to be fruit bearers, and when they don't bear that fruit, they miss being who God intended them to be. Then we get our gospel reading. Jesus has entered the temple area and he is confronted. He's confronted by the uh, religious leaders, the chief priests and, and elders of the community. But it, you have to picture this as being a very crowded area. This is the week we call Holy Week, but it is also the week leading into the High Holy Day of Passover in Jerusalem, where the city swells with religious pilgrims from all over the Mediterranean area. Jesus is teaching, in this case, 
to a crowd of religious pilgrims and his disciples. The chief priests and elders come to Jesus. We know from all four Gospels, they are gravely concerned about the potential for Jesus to disrupt the tentative goodwill of Pontius Pilate and the Roman government in allowing the practice of their religion and the observance of the High Holy Days. Jesus being non-credentialed and clearly working outside the authorized institution has the potential to create problems for the power brokers of his day. They want to know, given his procession into Jerusalem, the popularity among the crowd, and his upsetting the temple economy with his turning over of money changing tables, by what authority is he operating under? Jesus, always the good rabbi, answers a question with another question. Verses 24 to 26, Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd for all regard John as a prophet. Jesus knows he has an audience of people the crowd of whom some were baptized by John and of whom, uh, of whom saw him as God's prophet, preparing to inaugurate the Messianic era. These educated, respected, and religiously right-thinking leaders must dance delicately with their answer in light of the crowd listening and surrounding them. We see this exchange creates a great debate within their circle. They argue among themselves, knowing there's no good way to answer this question without looking foolish or causing a riot. They choose the safe path. Verse 27. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Jesus is not afraid or intimidated by those in positions of power. Jesus has a mission to fulfill. Jesus is more concerned about revealing God's will rather than play it safe. Remember in Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11, in the, in the desert, when the tester, tempter, Satan offered Jesus an easy and safe way, whatever needs he might have? But Jesus refused to compromise his identity or his mission. Matthew 21, verses 28 to 32, is a parable, the parable of two sons, tying into Jesus' answer or response to the religious leaders. This story is an invitation for both the priests and elders and the crowd to consider doing the will of the Father. Both sons are offered the same invitation to go and work in the vineyard. One says, sure, but never shows up to work. The other says, no, but then finds his way to the vineyard. The big question is, who did the will of the Father? The answer may be tied earlier in Matthew's gospel in chapter 7, verse 21, where we hear Jesus say, Not everyone who says, says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Or the answer may be tied to Matthew 9, verse 13, when Jesus is under criticism for dining with tax collectors and sinners. It reads, but you, his critics, go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. In the context around the question of authority and John the Baptist, Jesus uses this little story to illustrate how John was sent by God to show the right path to take. 
But the religious leaders, believing they are true believers, chose not to believe John. They are like the first son. But then the tax collectors and prostitutes made their way into the Jordan River, got baptized by John, and began to walk the path that led to life, which led to Jesus, which led to understanding that God is about relationships, not rules and rituals. Jesus points out that these leaders and critics of his teaching and mission saw the demonstrable change made in the lives of people when they learned of God's love and forgiveness. But still they, the religious leadership, resisted changing their mind and believing in John the Baptist and believing now in Jesus. This little exchange is not an attempt by Jesus to one-up the leaders. I want to believe that as Jesus gets closer to the cross, he wants these men, and they were all men, to understand who God is, who he is, and what is the real good news or word of blessing that God seeks to share with the whole world. This good news is not intended to be a means of excluding and judging others, but it is an invitation to trust in God's mercy and love and realize the work in the vineyard may be hard, sometimes difficult, but the end result is fruit that makes it all worth it. If we take anything away from this lesson, it is that the invitation Jesus extends to all people is to trust in him. It is an invitation to not just profess that trust with our lips, but to live out that trust in response to the needs of our neighbor and to act as he himself has acted. May this introduction help prepare you for this coming Sunday and invite all of us to put our trust in Jesus, not just with our words, but with our actions. God bless you.